Welcome to season three of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. Sonia Satra is a soap opera star, award-winning mind-body coach, and motivational speaker. She knows firsthand about the ups and downs in both entertainment and entrepreneurship. You might have seen her as Lucy Cooper Spaulding on the longest-running daytime soap, The Guiding Light. She also portrayed cycle nurse Barbara on One Life to Live. The founder of Modicize, Satra helps people find their purpose and create a blueprint to follow. She is a certified life coach, holistic coach, hypnotist, neuro-linguistic programming practitioner. Please welcome Sonia Satra. Thank you. <laughs> Very excited to be here today. So I want to know a little more about your background. Where did you grow up? So I'm a Jersey girl, and I admit it. I, <laughs> so I grew up um, in New Jersey, northern Jersey, a place called Cedar Grove, very close to Montclair. Some people know that. Until fourth grade, and then my mom was a history professor, and she got a sabbatical. So we moved to England, to Botley, Oxford, actually, for a year, and then came back and moved to what was then West Patterson, and now fancier name that's Woodland Park in New Jersey as well so pretty much a New Jersey girl this is so interesting to me what made you decide to drive across the country to Hollywood to become an actor you're not alone in doing that but it's such a gutsy thing to do it was definitely an out of the box thing, particularly for my family. My mom was a history professor and my oldest sister was in med school and my other sister was in engineering school. And so here I was like, I'm going to Hollywood to be an actress. <laughs> like, that was not necessarily what anybody thought. I was supposed to probably be the lawyer, right? To finish that whole trilogy there. But I had been playing tennis. I think it all started. I was playing tennis with my mom and this photographer saw me and he asked if I would be interested in doing a local hair ad. And I was 16 and I thought that sounded cool. Like, of course, I'll get free hair product for a hair ad. And that was really the opening. That was such a fun experience for me. I thought it was really cool. I enjoyed it. And so when I got to college, I was a you know, typical bro college student and I was working in the dining hall and waiting tables outside trying to just, you know, make ends meet. And I thought, well, maybe I could do some modeling. Maybe that would be another way to make some money. And so at the time, we didn't have the internet. That's how long ago it was. I looked in the New York Times in Help Wanted under Models Wanted. And I can say that is not a good idea. <laughs> that was like every scam in the book was there. My mom was pretty great. She really entertained my whims, as she would say. And she came in with one on one of those interviews and they were asking for $10,000 and we'll make you a star. And clearly I didn't have that. So that wasn't going to happen. But then through a friend of a friend of a friend, I ended up at a commercial agency, not knowing that, I think he was modeling and I was there with my little portfolio and uh, they came out and asked if I could read just a little copy of a Pizza Hut script and I had watched a commercial so I read it and they thought that I was good enough and they were going to send me out and I had a bit of beginner's luck. I came out of the gate very strong. I booked the very first commercial I went out on. It was actually for a grocery store. And then after that, I became the counter girl queen. I was like McDonald's, Burger King, Pizza Hut, <laughs> Wendy's, Burger Heaven, you name it, all of them. 
And that was really, that was like the second sort of big aha of maybe this is something I could do. So I started to take an acting class in the city. And ironically, my very first audition was for Guiding Light. And I screen tested, which is the final, final audition. Like you negotiate your contract, it's down to four people. And I didn't get it, but I thought I should consider this. And my sister at the time was living in LA. She was an engineer at this point. And so I went out for a summer vacation to visit her and decided if this is what I want, this is probably where I should be. And that was the the type the day I like call my mom, I'm gonna come to Hollywood. So I went back, I got my beat up Honda Accord and my $500 and drove across country. <laughs> so <laughs> that was how it all kind of started. I imagine your parents were like, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not, not oh, supportive. <laughs> hey, that was not where I saw this going. Uh, but you know, I had my good arguments for it. I sounded very rational. <laughs> so it, kind of it probably out. helped that my sister was out there. So but yeah, I went there, slept on her couch for probably too long, according to her fiance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, he was really nice, actually. And uh, yeah, I were, I did, you know, the classic waiting tables. And I realized once I got there how hard it was because up until now, I kind of hit a bit of beginner's luck and things were kind of rolling along it seemed as if hey you know you audition you get a job but not so much once I got there and that was when I really learned wow this is a business that's why they call it the entertainment business I also after getting rejected a lot learned that the best actors weren't always the people who worked the most weren't always the best but they were the people with the strongest mindset and so that was really when I started studying mindset was to help me to withstand all of the rejection that I got to sort of pick yourself up and keep on going. Yeah, it isn't an easy life at the beginning there, if, you know, or ever, if you know. Yeah, if you're not an a ever, <laughs> totally. And even then, I think they're always still, I think there's a they're always looking spot, for work, right? right? That they're always looking for what's that next job and will they get the big one? Yeah. Yeah. And even when you get the big one, that might be the only big one. Exactly. So it's, yeah, definitely not a, a, a profession you want to go into if certainty and security is something you're looking for. <laughs> I feel like yeah. working in the media. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I think anything in that world, it yeah. is, but it's an exciting industry and it was, uh, it was great. And I'm, I'm really grateful for the fact that I kind of did pick up and, and leave and go. So. Yeah. And, and of course there's something about being a creative it's, it, you really can't put a description on it. I don't think it's just, you know, there's like two sets of people, right? There's the creatives who, to the other side, look crazy. <laughs> and I'm good with that. But, right. You know, but I, I'm not going to be solving any math problems anytime soon. <laughs> so true. And we need both sides. But if you're creative yeah. and you're trying to fit into the math box, that's yeah, you're oh. going to probably struggle and not really feel as if you're living your best life. So, yeah. yeah. But even if a lot you, of those people now, <laughs> and as a creative, even when you, you don't succeed, at least, you know, you don't feel as bad because you keep trying, because you've tried. I think if you don't try to go after your dream, you're going to spend your life wondering what if. I so agree. You know, you've got one shot. Why not go for it? And Guiding Light, that show is the longest running Daytime soap. Yes. And was on the air since the 1930s. What do you think made that show so successful? Well, it started as a 15 minute radio show and then moved, I think, to a 30 minute radio show and then a 30 minute, half hour video and then to the full hour. I think it was one of the first, and I think they were at, at the time, you know, now you look back at soap operas and it seems very dated, but at the time they really were trailblazers. They really were dealing with topics that 
women wanted to know about, but was not talked about. So it was sort of like that place where you could go and see other people having these experiences that maybe you, you wanted to know about. They were really taking on a lot of social issues. And I think that is what kept them at the forefront for so long. I give them a lot of credit because it's not easy to stay on the air for 75 years. That's a lot that of time. Crazy. <laughs> but I will say, I always say this about soap opera fans. They are some of the most loyal and dedicated fans I've ever met in my life. Uh, and, and I think it is partially because you are in their living room every single day. So you almost become a friend or somebody that they think they know because when people would stop me, they would talk to me as if I were the characters, either one. <laughs> and they would give me advice and tell me what I was doing right and what I was doing wrong. And so <laughs> I think you became one of them. And that was part of why they really hold it so dear to them. Yeah. And then we got the evening soaps like Dallas. Oh my God, Dallas. Oh, so I was a diehard Dallas fan. My life evolved around that show. I would not do nothing on a Friday night. Yes, Dallas was me too. My sister lived in Australia. She... <laughs> so, so true. My and... sister was doing a semester abroad in Australia and I was literally writing letters. This is what happened this week. And, you know, I would just like 10 page letters of everything that happened on Dallas. <laughs> And that because that was before the internet and it was also before you could record shows. Yes. Yes, you couldn't miss it. It was oh, big. No. And why doesn't Amazon or Netflix bring it back? I know. I know. I wish they would. I think they'd get viewers. I got so excited when they brought out the TNT version too, because I thought, oh yes, yes, yes. I'm probably like the only one that really loved it, you know, because I yes. didn't stay on the air very long. I was like, yes, yes, yes. I totally agree. <laughs> I think reality TV became the new soap operas. Oh, and I always say it was actually during the God, my guiding light era that it happened because it was during the OJ trials. And we got move time. We used to be we were at three o'clock for decades, you know, and then yeah. Everybody was so glued to the OJ trial. They moved us to 9 a.m. And that's when things started to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And I think they realized people were so into this real television and that was cheaper to film. And so that was really, to me, the beginning of the end for soaps and the beginning of mm -hmm. reality TV. But, but that's a soap opera. People on. think it's reality, but it's really not. It's practically scripted. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Anybody that doesn't know that doesn't know entertainment. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> and of course, One Life to Live was also another long running show, as yes. many are, when Secret Storm ended and The Young and the Restless began. And it's still on. So I don't know how many years that is. It's at least 50 years, I think. Oh, God. Actually, I've been for, watching for it. Young and the Restless. Yes, easily. <laughs> I've been watching it that long. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, but a lot of creatives get their start, whether they work in film or nighttime television or whatever they do later on in the field. They get their start through soaps, a lot of them. David Hasselbeck was on The Young and the Restless. And, you know, Sh uh, Shamir Moore uh, was on The Young and the Restless. A lot of them were on The Young and the Restless. You. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So do you think about that when you get that gig? Or is it just a, a work to eat thing? <laughs> Uh, yes, you definitely, I think anytime you get any acting job, you think of what is possible from that. And soaps, the, a lot of, there is a huge list of people who did soap operas who moved on to become huge stars. So yes, you definitely, uh, it definitely opens doors. You know, there was a little bit of that thing of once you get in soaps, you're stuck in soaps. But I think during the time I was on, that was being broken left and right. There were so many people that had moved on that that no longer was the fear. And I think soap operas are an 
incredible training ground. The the volume of work and the amount of hours. Talk about getting your 10,000 hours of experience. I got it doing soap operas because pretty much every day, especially if you're in a big storyline, they have what they call a front burner story and a back burner storyline. So when you're in the front burner, you're working pretty much every day. And it rotates a bit, although Lucy was a pretty big character on Guiding Light. So during my time, I worked most of the time. And so, yeah, it's a lot of lines. I, you know, people ask me, how do you memorize all of them? And I remember a fellow actor had said, yeah, you know, you might get 50, 55 pages a day. And I thought, how on earth am I ever going to do this? But I did on my 10th day of work, I had 54 pages and I was still trying to learn, hit my mark in people's names. And I was, I was so nervous that day, but it, it was such a great lesson in you you know, more than you think you do. Cause I remember I was in a diner scene and I was, there was a countdown five, four and three, two, one, you're supposed to walk in the door. And I was standing out there thinking, I don't even know the first line. I have no idea what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> and somehow two, one, and I was like walking through the door and lines were coming out of my mouth. And apparently they were the right ones because they didn't yell cut. So <laughs> <laughs> really learning to trust that if you've done the work, you'll know it. And it is film. So if you really mess up, they do yell cut. But in soaps, you don't get a lot of second chances you need to move it along because you're filming about a hundred pages per day wow. a film script they could do that over months you know yeah. tv will do it over a week maybe and so it's fast it's fast i remember doing a movie after that and some guy was he had it was a lower budget and he had seven pages that day and he's like i have seven pages of dialogue and i was like <laughs> Try 57, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it, it definitely gave me a, a leg up in, in both confidence and experience and in learning everything you need to know on a set. <clears throat> so when they film, when does that show air? Yeah, uh, good question. It varied a little bit from soap to soap, but generally we were about three weeks ahead. Okay. okay, and well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, so I guess, although people would ask you what's going to happen, and I'm like, hmm, what do you know versus what I know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and you would get the week's worth of scripts on a Monday, but the reality was, if you were working every day, you were not memorizing Friday's script on Monday because you yeah. still had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So you know, you'd work all day, and then you'd go home and you'd memorize the script for the next day. And it became a great exercise in short-term memory. You grab that scene, you do it, boom. Next scene, boom. <laughs> and the so. soaps were like the Marvel movies today where you were under an embargo. You could not say what was going to happen. No, no. Under they, threat of life were, <laughs> or whatever. Yes, you know? exactly. Like the that Marvel, care, the Marvel okay. guys cannot say nothing. In the contract, I imagine it was the same with you guys in the in yes. your contract. Yes, it was very much so. So I got very good at, oh, it's exciting. You have to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, Lucy gets into some crazy stuff. So yeah, stay tuned. But, you, you know, it was also one of, it was a great lesson to me too of the power of, of television because one of, probably the most satisfying days or days that made me feel as if I was actually doing something that made a difference. Cause sometimes the storylines were a little absurd. So you were like, this is nuts, <laughs> but I, Lucy was in a rape storyline. She was date raped. And, um, I, I was very active in publicity, trying to get rape hotline numbers out and, and speaking. And I had met with the, the head of the the sort of rape department in New York City just to get as much information as I could because I wanted to be able to at least share real information that would be helpful. And I also did a self-defense class, actually, and I was able to incorporate that into the script. It was pretty amazing that they took that to heart. But there was a day I got a letter from a 
fan and it was a young girl. And she said, the day Lucy got raped, I got raped. And the day you got help, I decided to go get help. It still makes me teary. I'm just like, Whoa. oh my God. Oh my wow. God. Yes. Uh, so you just never know. It was a huge power of the medium. And, you know, they did take on sometimes these important storylines. And even if they went off on tangents, the, the core of it was meaningful. And that, and who knows if that girl would have gotten help if she hadn't seen that character get help. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. That's wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was exactly how I felt. Wow. So, so powerful. When a character gets written out of the show, you know, it kind of has to be devastating when you read that. So how, how do you work through that disappointment while trying to find another gig at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was very lucky on both shows because I made the decision first before they made it for me. So I never got the script where I was, you know, reading the, my demise. Like Game of Thrones, um, you know? <laughs> exactly. Oh, no. I die but but there were people who did and so I I watched it it is pretty devastating because honestly I don't think it's the most tactful way of hiring somebody giving them a yeah. script and letting them learn that way oh by the way uh, <laughs> oh yeah by the way you're not coming back anymore you've been on for 10 years but you're gone now yeah so yeah I knew my end was coming I had an end date and even that was kind of hard because at the time I wasn't married I didn't have kids and I thought well if I'm ever going to play a different character I should move because it's a really great job and it's very comfortable and I could keep going and I debated that and sometimes wondered whether I should but I decided to take another chance take a risk and leave but yeah the day you get that script where you where you realize wow I'm really leaving I'm gone I'm off <laughs> life is going on without Lucy um yeah, it definitely is an impactful because everybody becomes a family. You spend so much time with everyone on set and the fans almost become a bit of your family. Yeah. So it's a it's a big deal. Well, and also television is, you know, unlike the movies where it's one and done. Yeah. Um, television is literally a job like you can go to work every day <laughs> right it, it is it is and, be, and it does feel like that so it's kind of nice to have the work <laughs> totally it's very nice it's a great thing and so yeah at the same time you're watching your demise you're sitting there thinking oh my gosh what's gonna be my next job yeah. am I ever gonna work again and, and then uh, there was always that the soap opera star like the soap opera actress right. soap actor that oh well because they worked or even back then on television if you worked in television, even if you were on the right. biggest television show there was, they, for some insane, they didn't think certain people could do the job because right. it's the right. work they did before. It's like, I know it's, it's, <laughs> yes, that was a very crazy stigma. And I was very happy. It was starting to be broken when I was there, but it definitely existed. And I definitely got that. Oh, she's too soapy. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> if I hadn't been on a soap, I never would have gotten that feedback, but because I was, yeah. it almost gave them permission to say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You could have been in any movie there was if you weren't on the soap. Yeah. That, that makes right. total sense. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. If I had been in horror films, I probably would have been like, oh, she's too horror film. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> the, the transition I want to see though, is from porn to mainstream. Oh, the porn yeah. actors to mainstream that's what they did it to. it did it I knew a few of those I think people. there was what yeah there was a couple yeah. yes it's not a lot but some made no. that that crossover not very yeah. often it happens but yeah I could see you started this business what were modus eyes and what were some of the key challenges challenges you faced well, first of all, when did you decide to start it? And also, what are some of the key challenges you faced when developing it? So I started when my daughter was born. I was always that friend that people would come to and ask for advice. I'd studied mindset so much for so many years. 
and I really, at the end of the day, was extremely passionate about it and loved it. And so I didn't mind, like I was happy to help people figure things out. But when I was pregnant with my daughter, I decided, you know, maybe I'll just get my life coaching certification just and actually know what you're supposed to do when people come to ask. It. But I hadn't completely walked away from acting at the time. As soon as my daughter was born, I was back in acting. And at that time, I was starting to open the door to speaking. And I was trying to get this coaching off the ground. And I was a new mom. And my husband was working around the clock. And I kind of realized I wasn't doing anything well. <laughs> I was just too scattered, too tired, too not really focused. And so I actually had a day. I was offered an opportunity to speak or I had a request audition. So it was a little more than a regular audition. They were requesting me along with a, a small group for a series recurring role. And at that point, I had to make the decision, am I going to do the speaking gig or am I going to go for this request audition? And they couldn't reschedule it. And that was the day I decided, you know what, I think I'm going to do the speaking gig. I, I, I oh. felt more pulled. I felt I really loved helping people. I loved helping make other, I felt like I had lived my dreams. I'd taken so many chances, so many risks. I learned so much and I, it was really exciting to me to help other people to do the same thing. And to, and so that was, that was a big, that was a big turning point in my decision to really pursue more of the coaching and the speaking. So I've always kind of had my foot in the door on the acting. I haven't totally given it up, but I, I wasn't as focused on it as uh, mm -hmm. I was with the rest. And so, yeah, I mean, I think like any new business, it's figuring out what is this business? How do you do this? And at the time, life coaching was relatively new. Now it's just exploded. I remember all my life coaching friends, you know, bringing in articles like, look, look, we're getting coverage. And I was thinking, that's not so great. Like this is going to get too popular. <laughs> <laughs> and it did. So now everybody's a life coach, but I, I love, I love, I love what I do. I think that was what I was meant to do. And I think all of my experience through the acting and, and the struggle of that and, and studying it and applying it and having it work really was, the precursor to what I do. Who are the people you had in mind when you created Modicize? And what is the message or what is the thing that you want, like the whole umbrella of it to speak to? Yeah. So I do share this story, but it really was the first time I did Modicize. And it was way before it was back in the acting days before I ever thought I was ever going to do any kind of business or coaching or anything like that. But when I got off Guiding Light, I definitely had the imposter syndrome. I, I really fell hard into that. And I was positive I was never going to work again. Why did I leave? That was such a good job. I had regular steady work. 6,000 actors had auditioned for that role. Somehow I miraculously got it. <laughs> Who was I to walk away from that job? You know, I just the whole nine yards. And I really, really went down that spiral and embodied that whole belief of I'm never going to work again. And I started to hang out with other people who believed they were never going to work. And I, I, you know, I was partying a little too much, drinking probably a little too much. And I just, I wasn't as focused. And even the auditions I did go on, I would walk into the room as if I was not going to get that job. Yeah. And my body language, everything. I just embodied this belief. And sure enough, a year and a half later, I had not worked one single day. And I was turtle sitting very glamorous for a friend and just trying to earn some extra cash. They lived in the Pacific Palisades and they had this beautiful house overlooking the beach. And I was sitting up there overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And in that moment, I had this aha of, wow, I've used the same mindset tools that I used to create success as I am doing now to create failure. And I realized when I first got out there, I was visualizing, I was doing that practice all the time, imagining myself on TV, getting the job, doing, you know, being successful. 
And now I was visualizing failure and not getting the job. And I would ask powerful questions. Questions are a really powerful thing. Our brains will answer them. So if you ask a good question, you'll get a better answer. But I'd ask, you know, what can I do? Who can I meet? And now I was, why won't anyone give me a job? Why can't I get it? You know, why can't I work? And my self-talk was in the beginning all about somebody's made it. Why can't I? You know, and now it was... I'm never going to work again. That was a mistake leaving. And even though I was still taking action, I was still auditioning more so in the beginning than now. Although now I had all of this experience, all of this credit, I should have been able to take off at that point, but I was getting in my own way. And so my results were a direct correlation of the mindset I had. And that was a really big wake up call. And at that point, I thought, I got to change this and fast. And if I did this once, maybe I could undo it. And so I created this whole plan. I decided I was going to run. I was going to get in great shape. I was going to stop like all the, the partying and all that stuff. I didn't need it. I wanted to get my head back in, in gear. And I was running. I started to run in the Santa Monica Canyon and there was this path that led up to this bridge. And so I would run every day. I'd visualize being back on TV. I would visualize, you know, hearing you got the job. I would ask questions. What can I do today? Who can I meet up with? I would do positive affirmations. And up on the top of the hill, I realized it was a canyon. So whatever I yelled would echo back. So I would yell, you got the job. And I'd hear back, <laughs> you got the job. <laughs> And then I'd celebrate as if I had heard that. And three weeks later, I booked a national commercial, first job in a year and a half. And three months later, actually running down that path, I got a call from my manager saying, you got the job. Cool. And it was for psycho nurse Barbara on One Life to Live. And so years later, when I was learning coaching and I had had my daughter, then I had my son. I realized I wasn't really doing the mindset tools as much as I knew. And I knew how, how powerful they were and how much they could work. But I was kind of getting to the gym like 20 minutes in the morning. And so one morning I was on the treadmill, no mistake. And I was running and I was watching some bad news thinking, wouldn't it be better if I had a vision board or, you know, I was doing some mindset tools. And again, another sort of light bulb moment, like, huh, what if, what if that, were possible. Like, what if there was a class that actually could guide me through all this stuff? Because that would be helpful while I'm working out. Again, very efficient, very effective. New mom, I need to get it all in. And that was the day I even came up with the name, Modicize. So I would run and then I'd stop and write in my phone, you know, Modicize, motivational exercise, and all of these different ideas of what this class could look like. I really think I was creating it for myself because I wanted it. I wanted to be able to combine that. And then when I started to dig a little deeper, it was right when all of the research on the brain and exercise was starting to explode. I don't know if you've ever read the book Spark. It's brilliant. And that was one of the first books that started to talk about what happens to our brain and neurogenesis and the rewiring of your brain and how you're more creative and focused and all of those things when you work out. And they had all these studies in schools and kids were doing better at school and they were, you know, they were getting healthy. So I thought, well, maybe there's actually something to this. Like your brain is really open and we're kind of watching, we're being fed news or even reality shows, nothing against them. Like, it's fine if you want to have that. But when you're working out, it's your brain is really susceptible to messages. And so I just thought, what a great thing to be very intentional about your thoughts. And then, of course, I had had this experience you know, about 10 years prior to that of me running and, and really turning my life around. And so that was how Modicize was born. And I, I really, it's all about achieving goals, going after yeah. your dreams and, and mm -hmm. just being really, it's a, it's a seven step process in the order of the questions kind of matter. It's geared towards any goal that you want to accomplish. And it's really done with movement. At the time I was doing aerobics and I
I had studied NLP, neurolinguistic programming, which is a lot of mind body connection kind of work. And so I was really trying to make every move match the mindset. So I, I created this DVD. I think it was the last DVD ever known to mankind, <laughs> but it still exists as a, down, as a download. So it was a class of this modicized process and all of the moves match the mindset. So it starts to get wired into your body in a different way. So it really is a way of aligning your mind, your body, in your heart or your energy and what you put out in the world. As I started to test it and do it with people, I was just amazed by what people were coming up with because I don't know, I'm sure you have, because you're, you know, superstar, you've done so many amazing things and you're active and in sports. So have you ever had that moment when you've gone for a walk or gone and done something physical and all of a sudden you have a great idea? Well, that's how I created my publishing business is I, <laughs> I had... I had, uh, I don't do it now, except for my own books, but I've just finished producing my first book, Inside the NHL Dream. And I was, I got lots of great feedback on it. And I, it was like a real, pro, that's like another podcast. It was a real process yeah. of how I marketed that too. So uh, oh, wow. I used that book basically to up try and elevate my credibility in the industry. But I kept getting all these emails from readers asking me about the book publishing process. Mm. And I thought it was like too many to ignore. Right. So I literally sat at my computer and I saw, and it just came to me like you. Yeah. It just like, I'm going to be a publishing expert. Wow. <laughs> and as soon as I said that, I got another email. I need help with my book. Oh, like, see, I so it gives me like, chills, right? It's like right? the world is like, answering. and it was like, I'd never been able to re reproduce that. <laughs> I might have to get your program. <laughs> Go for a walk. You'll get it. I promise. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. It, it was, okay. it's, it, it, you sent chills down my spine about the, the motivation, like about the part where how much effort you put into success and the mindset and I'm going to get it. It's so true. And I, I've gone through it a few stages myself where yes that's exactly what happens you take that and you put it no nobody's gonna hire me nobody's gonna you know yes. oh. I'm too old I'm too this I'm too mm -hmm. yeah oh yeah wow. <laughs> yes exactly exactly and yet you've proven you can do the opposite it's amazing yes. the power of our minds and what we put out. And it's interesting because now they can study so much more of your mind and the frequency of your thoughts. And so when you have a very negative thought or, you know, going into that sort of, I can't do it place, your frequency is way, way lower. Actually, there's a really cool study where they can measure, it, it's obviously very controlled in a, in a lab, but they could take like the atoms that are the same frequency of different moods, I guess you could say. So happy or sad or depressed or angry. And so, and when, when a, a pitchfork that's tuned to one of those frequency goes out, puts out, it emits its frequency, whichever one of the glasses is holding the atoms of that frequency, it will start to activate that mm. atom and it will spin so fast that the glass will explode. Wow. That's how powerful it is. And so when we're putting that, and I'm positive, I was walking into rooms like, yeah, you're not going to hire me. Of course. I'm not gonna, <laughs> yeah, of course you're not going to hire me. <laughs> yeah. You walk in and the, yeah, actually now that I think about it, you walk into positions where, yeah, they'd be stupid not to, I got this, even though there was no hope in hell that you were going to get it. You know? Right. And you get it. And you get it. Exactly. It it's so true. And when I think of every role, in fact, the when I got the role of guiding light, I was actually working with a coach on a different audition. And I was going for, I don't know, my second or third callback on the guiding light piece. And he was like, well, do you want to go over it? And I was like, 
no, I got this one. <laughs> I was like, I kind of just felt it. I was like, I, I know, wasn't even yeah. messing. I kind of kind of knew. I mean, I didn't. I had screen tested. This was my ninth screen test. So it wasn't as if I had gotten close and then, you know, gotten it. So this, but this, for some reason, this one, I was like, I felt like it was my role. So I, I, I think that is part of what you put out in the world. And we do have control over that. Sometimes you're, you are right for it, right? Like that whole universe is like pushing you into the publishing. And that's just the right fit, the right time. Everything is working. At the same time, when we're in a more positive perspective, we're so much more resourceful. And that's when I think those ideas just pop. And the other thing I'm hearing from this conversation we're having is that we are not all defined by one thing. So yes, you are still an actress, but and you are this other person. And tomorrow you may decide, you know, I'm bored with this. <laughs> I don't want to do right. this modicize anymore. I'm going to like sell it or whatever. And I've kind of gone through like that. I think they say the average person changes careers like five times. I think I've got that beat, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But that's you know, because you're creative. <laughs> I know. Maybe that's the creative curse. Maybe maybe the math brains don't have the curse. <laughs> oh, totally. And I, but I do think it's true. And I actually think that is one of the benefits of this day and age. A, we live longer. But B, there's we're not pigeonholed into these boxes anymore. We really can change and we can grow and we can expand into whatever we really want when we decide. And what has surprised you the most about the feedback you've gotten from your program? <laughs> I think the biggest one, and this was completely unintentional, was people who don't like exercise actually like it. Well, I got to sign up. Now. Yeah, so there you go. So you come on. And that was, I think it's because they're not thinking about exercise. So often exercise is, I got to go do it. I got to, you know, it's whatever. It's a should. Yeah. It's not necessarily like some want, even if you know you're going to feel better afterwards. I think the fact that you're thinking, you're focused on something that's exciting to you that you really want, and you're coming up with ideas, that I think is is why people aren't as focused on what they don't like about exercise or I got another 20 minutes or another, you know, set of this, whatever. So that was an unexpected surprise. And I think the goal, and I was very happy it worked, was that people were just coming up with really, really great ideas. Uh, people came up with brand new business ideas, strategies for selling companies. They fixed relationship problems. I even had a woman, and this was her journey, but she was obese and she wanted to do this, but she couldn't do the exercises the, as the way they were. But she started to do a little bit of, of walking and then eventually started swimming and doing motorcycles when she swam. And she's lost over 300 pounds. Wow. Yeah. And she said, you know, I thought it was all about the eating and the exercise, but she's like, it's not, it is all about the mindset and the re repeating the motor size process. She said, I get it. I get why that helps you change. Wow. So yeah, those are some fun success stories. But you were also in a limited series, The Man Who Built America and American Playboy, The Hugh Hefner Story, as glorious freaking yes. Steinem. I know, <laughs> I know. What an epic role. <laughs> that, I mean, wow, what an incredible role. So, but to be able to play a female icon. Yeah. Is it hard to play a person who's still alive or how do you approach a role like that? <laughs> yeah, it was very intimidating. I'm not going to lie. That was, I was so nervous. It was really hard. I did actually try to reach out to her, but I didn't hear back. She hated you, Hefner. Because they tried to bring her in actually uh, as a, because it was a docudrama. So they had people who were speaking and she wanted nothing to do with the project. But 
I watched a lot of videos and so it was just trying to kind of duplicate it as best as you can. I read a lot of her material to try to get into her head, but that's hard. That's that's an intimidating one. Uh yeah, especially gave him my best shot. That kind of a character, right? <laughs> so, so true. Absolutely. Uh, but we were all, I guess, playing other people that were alive. And so perhaps there was a little suspension of belief <laughs> that gave us all a little grace. And that series was nominate, nominated for an Emmy, too. And so that kind of has to give you a lift in your step. Yeah, no, it really was. It was interesting. It was an interesting project. Um, yeah, you know, lots of dichotomies going on in that. But to be able to play her and to have that perspective and to step into such an icon is incredible. So what's next for you down the pike? So I have a very small role in a pro in a show that's going to come in Netflix in May, which I was recently told I'm not supposed to say anything about. Unfortunately, I can't, but follow and I'll let you know when it comes on. It's also a docudrama. And then I'm also in a movie called Gritsky's Office. And that's fun. It's about female hockey players and I'm the mom of the daughter and it's actually about as opposite as I really am in person because as the mother of the daughter I'm trying to discourage her from following her dream and telling her to play it safe <laughs> I was like if I pull off this role that's the best acting I've ever done because <laughs> I would never do that <laughs> well everybody in the city of Edmonton will be watching that one <laughs> absolutely and it was actually shot in Minnesota too it was, a, it was so real hard hardcore ice hockey place but yeah that was kind of fun I never knew that about Gretzky apparently if this movie was based on truth I think it was but he used to always skate behind the goalpost because I guess behind there he was followed a little bit less than out in front of he the scored goal. a lot of goals from there he did. And that was part of his strategy because he was a little smaller. And so he could get back. He was and fast, you know, and he could maneuver really well. But apparently from behind the goalposts, he had the best view of the entire rink and yep. all the players. And so it became known as Gretzky's office. And I thought that was really cool. I didn't know that. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad that we got to do this. And Me too. thank you so much. Absolutely. My pleasure. My pleasure. I could do this Thank all you. day because I, I know. Such a huge <laughs> I feel like we just so touched the star. surface of everything we have in common, too. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, thank you so much again, Sonia. Thank you. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. Please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.